Sony has rolled out a new beta firmware update for select users in the United States, Canada, Japan, UK, Germany, and France, and it's a big update for PS5 users and includes various enhancements and customizations to the interface and overall experience. Perhaps most notably, though, is the inclusion of M2 SSD support. Sony has revealed how beta users can install one, but it should be noted that those without access to the beta should not try installing a new SSD in their PS5 yet. For Sony, installing a NVMe M2 SSD in a console that does not have the beta firmware would require players to remove it before updating the software. There's also quite a few requirements, including an M2 SSD, that's PCIe Gen 4, has read speeds of 5,500 megabytes per second or faster, effective heat dissipation, and more. Because this is a beta, requirements and recommendations are likely to change, and Insomniac Games' core level designer has tested the beta and the SSD support on Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, and he confirms that it performs well and the game also loads quick, but not as fast as the internal one, and also the game is using the crack and compression technique which is impressive. This is even if it meets the current requirements and recommendations, as it differs from the PS5's internal drive greatly regardless. Whether or not Sony only means this for the beta or for the full launch of M2 SSD support, but it stands to reason that it means the latter. Of course, something could change between beta and full launch. Perhaps the next biggest change in the update helps clear up PS4 PS5 game confusion. On the home screen and in the game library, each game's title will now mention whether a game is PS4 or PS5, with each version appearing separately as well. Furthermore, this beta software includes 3D audio support for built-in TV speakers, which uses the PS5 DualSense controller to measure room acoustics. In turn, this is used and applied to a 3D audio setting. Plenty of other details, customizations, and tweaks are among this PS5 update, with this including a trophy tracker that'll let players focus on 5 trophies per game viaduct the control center the ability to pick between 720p and 1080p for PlayStation Now games, a new automatic video clip for high scores, trophies horizontal view, and a lot more like that. PS5 users are also getting access to some new personalization and customization options, such as the ability to rearrange controls in the control center, the friends tab and game base is getting better management options, and the ability to see how many friends are online. Players will also be able to view and write messages to friends and parties from the game base in the control center. Overall, these seem to be just the tip of the iceberg for everything in this beta PS5 firmware update. Now let's take a deep look into the installation and recommended SSDs for the PlayStation 5. It's important to start with the criteria necessary to activate this additional SSD slot and use the extra story mode. Firstly, at the moment, the use of the additional M2 slot is strictly available in a beta software update for the PS5 currently. At this time, Sony has not announced a specific date for when this capability will be available to all PS5 consoles, but any players can opt into the beta at any time. Additionally, from a hardware perspective, the process of adding the additional drive is not quite as plug and play as it is for Xbox Series X. For those familiar with changing the hard drive on PS4, the PS5 requires similarly minimal legwork and a screwdriver to add the drive. Outside of that, the more important criteria is what players need to know before purchasing and installing a new drive. Other than being in the M2 form factor, compatible PS5 SSDs have to match size requirements, minimum reading speeds, and cooling requirements as well. The full list of requirements are on PlayStation's website, but the gist of it is as follows. SSDs need to be PCIe Gen 4 square meters drives, the additional drive requires effective heat dissipation meaning some drives may need a heatsink, or use a drive with a built-in heatsink, the SSD needs around a 5500 megabytes per second read slash write speed, and must be 22 millimeters width, 25 millimeters drives are not supported. Beyond that, assuming players are aware of the prerequisites for installing the SSD, there are quite a few modern Gen 4 SSDs to choose from when expanding the PS5's memory. One of the most popular choices for high-speed PC storage in the M2 form factor is the Samsung 980 Pro, which is arguably the ideal choice for the extra SSD slot in the PS5. 
Utilizing the new PCIe Gen 4 interface, the 980 Pro easily manages read-slash-write speeds of 7,000 and 5,000 megabytes per second, respectively. Evolving on the 970 Pro's previous generation memory structure, this SSD outpaces even some mid-range gaming PCs out there, given how not many Gen 4-capable motherboards are out there. For those looking for the bleeding edge of speeds capable from a Gen 4 NVMe SSD, the WD Black SN850 is easily the best of the best, with 7,000 and 5,300 megabytes per second read-slash-write speeds, though not without a few catches. Tests from numerous sources and consumers have reported that WD's Gen 4 SSD does run hotter than most drives in PCs, and would definitely require a heatsink installation in the PS5 as well. Runner-up choices that are worth considering for PS5 storage expansion, as well are the Sabrent Rocket 4 Plus, and the Corsair Force MP600. The Sabrent Rocket 4 Plus is also an excellent choice, as it is capable of peak performance of 7000 and 6600 megabytes per second read slash write speeds, outpacing the Samsung drive, but comes in a bit pricier as a result. The Sabrent drive also runs just a bit cooler under load, so it may not necessarily need a beefy heatsink, unlike comparable drives. As for the Corsair Force MP600, Corsair's drive would be a solid budget option, as it reaches about the minimum 5,500 megabytes per second red slash write speeds for cheap, and includes a heatsink as well. Overall, these are all fantastic M2 SSDs that can utilize the PCIe Gen 4 architecture to match the read slash write speeds of the PS5's internal SSD. For those who want to jump in early, this beta release for PS5 is available now for players to opt into, and perhaps the official support will come to all PS5 consoles in due time. Comparing it with the Xbox Series X proprietary SSD, the PlayStation 5 have more options to choose from and support most of the M2 SSD sizes rather than sticking to a single model. Overall, all SSDs are costly, and as they will drop in price over the time, those who do not want to expand through SSD can wait or go with the regular HDD option. Moving forward we have more interesting things to cover from the latest interview of Jim Ryan, where sales numbers of PlayStation 5 games are updated, and we also have some other updates to discuss about. PlayStation 5 is Sony's fastest-selling games console, after surpassing 10 million sales worldwide. The new console reached the figure on July 18th, just under a month faster than the PlayStation 4 managed, which is impressive. Other sales figures released by Sony includes that Spider-Man Miles Morales has sold over 6.5 million copies since its launch last year. It is less than the 2018 Spider-Man in the same time frame, but it is very well selling on all parts of the world. PS5 exclusive Returnal, released in April, has exceeded 560,000 copies. Returnal is a new IP, and it is selling good at a consistent rate. There has been some price drops for the summer season sale. So, if you guys didn't pick up the game yet, you can buy it now at a lower price. Returnal is also stated as a mega hit by PlayStation, and that lead to the acquisition of Housemark. My estimate is that it could reach at least 3 million copies sold in the next year. Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, which was released last month, is already on over 1.1 million units worldwide, and it is the fastest selling game in the franchise. The marketing was done good, and sure Ratchet and Rivet is gonna rock the industry. Insomniac Ice and Beast mode right now. Meanwhile, Sony San Diego developed MLB The Show 21, which was released on non-PlayStation platforms, has surpassed 2 million sales worldwide, which is the fastest selling one in the franchise. The game actually has more than 4 million players, and was included in the Xbox Game Pass subscription service. Yeah. Death Stranding reached 5 million and Detroit Become Human reached 6 million worldwide. Sony did not numbers for Demon's Souls and Sackboy A Big Adventure, which is really disappointing. PlayStation 5 sales performance has been dependent on the company's ability to supply the demand, with the console sold out globally. CEO Jim Ryan said in a statement that improving inventory levels remains a top priority. Speaking with GamesIndustry.biz, Ryan adds that PS5 has seen double-digit growth in terms of engagement whether that's monthly users or gameplay time compared with the launch window of PS4. 
In terms of which markets are showing the highest demand, Ryan adds that it's too early to say. However, he's been excited by the reaction to PS5 in China. Jim Ryan also touched upon the console demand and the shortage could extend up to summer 2022. And there is one bad news here too, as Jim Ryan officially confirms that the Nix's software acquisition is for the PC ports, which is disappointing and also I have discussed about the disadvantages of PC ports and advantage of exclusives and the quality of gaming. So, whenever a PlayStation executive gives an interview, they mention the PC shit. I am not with the every game should be everywhere, and it is quite sad that PlayStation is moving towards PC, but as long as there is quality in their games, I as a gamer will be satisfied. But when the quality drops, then gaming is really in a serious trouble. To continue, we have another interview to cover about, as former PlayStation boss Sean Layden is skeptical about services like Xbox Game Pass viability largely due to the numbers not quite seeming to add up. The primary concern Layden seems to have, much like many of Service's other critics, regards the financial feasibility of including a diverse catalogue of games for $9.99 a month. According to Layden, Services will need about 500 million subscribers to make them profitable in the long run, a number that simply isn't realistic given where the industry is at right now. This is largely due to a stagnant audience. While it's true that the games industry has seen sizable revenue growth in the last few years, Layden says that the audience has remained around 240 to 260 million people for decades now, not factoring in mobile gamers. The key to solving this is ensuring a diverse games market, which is part of the appeal for Layden at his new gig at Streamline Media Group, which speak, s, 27 different languages throughout their studios and have people from 47 different countries. Layden also told that consolidation can take out the variety of games and also affect indies. But big publishers like PlayStation publishing variety of games in and supporting indies is definitely a step moving forward. And I also expect consoles to be the mainstream of gaming, which it is, and I don't want that to fade in the future. And I also predicting that the PlayStation 5 can pull off a lifetime sales figure of more than 200 million consoles sold. Ghost of Tsushima developer Sucker Punch Productions is hard at work on the game's expansion, Iki Island. Given the success of Ghost of Tsushima in 2020, the expansion is one of the most anticipated PlayStation releases of 2021. That said, Ghost of Tsushima fans are curious as to what form the game will take, particularly in terms of size and scope. Luckily, Sucker Punch staff writer Patrick Downs offered an idea of what players can look forward to as part of a re recent interview. Speaking with Press Start, Downs gave a pretty direct comparison for how big of an experience Iki Island will be in comparison to Ghost of Tsushima. Downs explained that fans should think of Iki Island as similar in size and content to Ghost of Tsushima's Izuhara region. It'll have that variety and depth of content and playtime, of course is how Downs characterizes the similarities between the two. Izuhara is, of course, Ghost of Tsushima's first major island region in the game, as well as its largest. While Downs doesn't explicitly state how long he expects the Iki Island expansion to last, it can be assumed based on typical Ghost of Tsushima playtimes. Just in a casual playthrough of Ghost of Tsushima, the first area can take over 15 hours. More thorough playthroughs can take up to 30 hours or more for Izuhara. It's not only the largest area in the game, but also the most densely packed when it comes to content for completionists. 15 to 40 hours for Iki Island sounds robust. One other key point to make is that while Izuhara is massive in the base version of Ghost of Tsushima, it's also the starting area. Which is to say, its content is easier than what players will find in the later two regions of Ghost of Tsushima. Iki Island isn't necessarily going to be significantly more difficult, but it's not content designed for players just starting the game. As such, it may be richer. What Downs is trying to convey is that Iki Island will be substantial. It's not just a DLC pack full of missions and cosmetics. It's a full experience with a massive open world to explore, a cinematic story, and plenty of content for completionists. That said, Sucker Punch obviously chose to make Iki Island require the base game, rather than let it be standalone like the Miles Morales game.
Ghost of Tsushima, one of the most commercially and critically successful PlayStation exclusive titles for the PS4 and PS5 generation, will soon have an all new DLC expansion for players to play and explore. The DLC is centered on a new region called Iki Island, and the game's developers are beginning to reveal additional details about what players can expect from the new content. Sucker Punch Productions' acclaimed RPG recently celebrated its one year anniversary. Players first dove into the beautiful Tsushima Island landscape as samurai Jean Sakai in the fight against the invading Mongols July 17, nearly a year to the day the game's expansion was announced. After swirling rumors of a standalone sequel, Ghost of Tsushima, director's cut was confirmed, centered around the mysterious Iki Island. In a recent interview with online publication Press Start, Ghost of Tsushima, Director's Cut senior staff writer Patrick Downs and art director Jason Connell divulged some new details on the new features coming with the new expansion. The pair touch on many different aspects of the DLC, but perhaps one of the most significant is the addition of horse armor. Seen in the Iki Island expansion trailer, players can now reinforce their steed with some well-deserved armor plating. The armor enables a new ability as well, called Horse Charge. Horse Charge is an ability that scatters guys out of the way and gives riding horseback through an area an entirely new use. The developers do say they have a number of things that we're not talking about in terms of equipment and abilities as of yet, indicating some DLC aspects may have to be organically discovered by players. However, there is plenty of other info that they did reveal, namely of the overarching intent of Iki Island's contrasting aspects to Tsushima. Players who've been following news of the expansion are aware of the new main villain, the Eagle, but the cryptic antagonist is indicative of the overall environment. Iki Island serves as a direct counterpoint to Tsushima, a new ID-covered biome, haven to pirates, smugglers, and raiders. These criminals are vastly different than the denizens of Tsushima, and staunch supporters of the Eagle, meaning Jean will have a new batch of enemies and types of enemies to fight against. Iki Island will only be accessible at the end of Act 1, which is also reportedly how long the DLC will take to complete. Players will be able to freely travel to and from the island, but only after a certain point of progression. However, one of the most popular details to have been revealed is the ability to tame cats, deer, and other animals. Expanding on the fan-favorite fox petting mechanic, Jean will be able to visit animal sanctuaries and interact with local Iki wildlife, including wild cats, deer, and even monkeys. Ghost of Tsushima director's cut launches in just a few weeks, meaning we won't have to wait long before venturing out to Iki Island and encounter the eagle. Speaking of expansions, Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics announced the release date for Black Panther War for Wakanda and an all-access weekend for Marvel's Avengers. The new expansion follows King T'Challa, the current Black Panther and ruler of the isolated but technologically advanced Kingdom of Wakanda. The expansion's plot revolves around T'Challa's struggle to balance his duties as king and superhero following a betrayal and tragedy. He must defend his people from the supervillain Claw, while also learning to trust those around him. It also appears that T'Challa's tech genius sister Shuri will play a significant role in the story. New and returning Marvel's Avengers players will explore the royal palace and jungles of Wakanda. The former serves as a fourth outpost, with new characters, vendors, and war table missions. Players will have a chance to explore Shuri's lab, the chambers of court sorcerer Zawavari, and Wakanda's war room. It also sounds like the palace offers a great view of Wakanda's capital city of Bernin Zana. Square Enix and Crystal Dynamics haven't revealed much new information about the developer's take on Claw. The cybernetic South African mercenary was a recurring secondary villain in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which Marvel's Avengers is partially inspired by. Most of his crimes in the films revolved around stealing and selling Wakanda's vibranium. That appears to be the case in the War for Wakanda expansion as well. Square has also not offered many details about the new zones and missions. However, much of the expansion will take place in Wakanda's verdant jungles. Meanwhile, the all-access weekend begins today and runs through Sunday, August 1st. It's available in all regions on PS4, PS5, Stadia, and PC via Steam. New players can try out the entire game for free, though PlayStation users require a PlayStation Plus subscription for online play.
New players that decide to buy can keep their progress after the free trial ends. The game is also 40% off during the period. Square Enix stated that Xbox players will have a similar opportunity to try the game for free at some point in the next few months. Additionally, all Marvel's Avengers players have access to special promotions during the All Access Weekend. These include but are not limited to a 400% boost to XP gain. Marvel's Avengers in-game purchases are also 50% off, and players have a chance to replay the game's Tachyon Anomaly event. The Black Panther War for Wakanda expansion for Marvel's Avengers releases August 17 for PC, PS4, PS5, Stadia, Xbox One, and Xbox Series X and S. Up next we have unfortunate news, as Ember Lab announces yet another delay for its stunning story-driven adventure game Kina Bridge of Spirits, but thankfully it won't be a long one. The huge reveal of the PS5 last year also gave players an idea of what games would be coming to the system at launch or soon after. One game that caught the attention of many players was Kina Bridge of Spirits, namely for its lush art design and Pixar-like visuals. Originally one of the biggest planned PS5 games coming this summer, it, unfortunately, looks like the highly anticipated title has been hit with another delay. Developed by Ember Lab, Kina Bridge of Spirits is actually the studio's first game. However, the studio has an amazing animation portfolio behind it, like the impressive The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask fan film, Terrible Fate. This story-driven action-adventure has players find and grow a team of small spirit companions called The Rot, which can be used to solve puzzles and other tasks in the environment. The plot of the game starts out quite simple, with Kina, a spirit guide, traveling to an abandoned village to search for a sacred mountain shrine. Addressing the Kina Bridge of Spirits community, Ember Lab posted on Twitter today announcing the game's delay to September 21, 2021. Ember Lab explains that the team is working diligently to bring the game to its audience, but that another month of development will help the studio ensure the best experience possible. The developers want to deliver the best version of Kina possible, which no doubt includes polishing the stunning visuals in Kina Bridge of Spirits and making sure it works seamlessly on all platforms. At first, Kina Bridge of Spirits was supposed to be a PS5 launch title, then it was expected in early 2021, then it received the most recent release date of August 24, 2021. While an additional month until release may not seem like a whole lot, it will likely disappoint numerous fans who have already been waiting for over a year. Considering how the development team was impacted by the effects of the pandemic, the delay can at least prevent unhealthy studio crunch. Even though many developers might mandate a period of crunch as a release day approaches, Gamers have come to have a more positive view when a game gets developed without crunch. Overall, many fans may be slightly disappointed to learn that Kina Bridge of Spirits is getting another delay. On the bright side, fans only have to wait one more month and expected to experience all the game has to offer. Many fans have pointed out that Kina Bridge of Spirits has some strong connections with The Legend of Korra, and it has been compared at times to games like The Legend of Zelda, Pikmin, and even Horizon Zero Dawn. Hopefully, Ember Lab releases a fully polished game that will be well worth the wait. At the last state of play, Sony announced one of the coming PS Plus games early, Hunter's Arena Legends. An ancient Asia-inspired battle royale game with PvE elements, the game is launching on PS Plus Day and date with its PlayStation platform release. The game is currently in early access on Steam, where it has garnered mostly mixed reviews from fans, so it'll be interesting to see how it does on PS4 and PS5. Joining it on PS Plus is the two PS4 games, having first been leaked by Sony itself, but confirmed in today's announcement, are Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Neighborville and Tennis World Tour 2. Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Neighborville sees players choose a side, that being either a plant or zombie class, and compete in variety of cooperative or competitive game modes. 
For co-op fans, it's a good pick, because split-screen local multiplayer is available in all modes, but despite its varied gameplay, it's very much a love-it-or-hate-it style of game. Overall Plants vs. Zombies is a classic franchise which has a diverse and unique universe. Tennis World Tour 2, on the other hand, is exactly like it sounds. It's a tennis game and has received mixed reviews since it released in September 2020. For tennis fans, it may scratch that itch especially as a free game, but much like Plants vs. Zombies, its appeal is limited to a very niche audience. PS Plus subscribers will be able to claim these games on August 3rd, but in the meantime, players can still snag the PS Plus free games for July 2021 should they so choose. This month included A Plague Tale, Innocence as the PS5 offering, as well as Call of Duty, Black Ops 4 and WWE 2K Battlegrounds on the PS4. Interestingly, each of these have a sequel of sorts in the works, with A Plague Tale Requiem recently announced, a new Call of Duty game slated to release this fall, and WWE 2K22 set to hopefully make up for the past two years, if WWE 2K20 more so. And that's all for the video guys, like and share the video for a greater audience. Comment your thoughts on the topics and if you want to contribute for the growth of the channel, the link to my PayPal in the video's description and in the channel banner. Donations are always appreciated, thanks for watching the video, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon, and until then from SMPV it's goodbye.